welcome to the fourth line podcast this is october the 12th thanksgiving 2020 with today's myself carl and stevie nick good morning carl it is the morning today it, it is the and, morning and happy thanksgiving canadian thanksgiving yeah happy canadian thanksgiving to you or as we call it here thanksgiving <laughs> what uh what, what are you thankful for today I'm thankful for a day, a lazy day. I'm thankful for just a day to relax. I'm thankful for, uh, I mean, I'm, if I was to go through the list, I'm thankful for a lot of things, but that's the thing. I'm thankful for this cup of coffee I'm having right now. I'm thankful that I had a, a slow start to the day. I'm slad, ha- thankful for a productive weekend. What about yourself? Yeah, I'm thankful for my family and stuff, but really I'm thankful that Steve Eiserman is the GM of the Detroit Red Wings because what a few days he had. Whew. I'm yeah. energized about this, Carl. You're pumped. We're ready. I'm, I'm pumped. It's like you didn't wake up 30 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had a rough night last night. <laughs> well, well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, help, we'll help get you through that, Nick. Uh, we've got a ton to talk about this week. Uh, we made our list. We checked it twice. And we think we didn't forget to talk about a Stanley Cup champion this time. So, Should we say it right off the top? properly congratulations to the tampa bay lightning on winning the stanley cup this year again <laughs> again <laughs> i mean we could talk uh congratulations to the los angeles lakers we could congratulate them that's true my favorite i mean there's a lot of things that are great about celebrations and this one uh didn't have any yet right they haven't had like the la celebration but there was none of the the uh, you know, COVID unfriendly things. My favorite part was the Lakers leaving Quinn Cook at the arena when they got back on the bus to their hotel. <laughs> that's great. I didn't see any of the celebrations, but that's just because I like to leave it to my imagination for how they celebrate a championship at Disney World. <laughs> yeah, they don't have to yell, I'm going to Disney like they do in baseball. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly. there. You're just there already. Yeah. Maybe That's they good. open Space Mountain for them. Maybe. Yeah. So we're, we're going to talk. We got the draft to talk about. We got free agency, which all of both of those come with trades and moves and all those sorts of things. So we'll get into all of that. Um, very exciting first week with our friends at Full Press, Nick. Uh, lots of fun having being over there. Uh, maybe we should put that. I know that it, like, it feels weird off the top. I should just put that back in at the front of the show, shouldn't I? Probably. Probably. All right, it does feel week. weird without it. It feels weird without something there. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll fill that void next week. Uh, but for this week, NHL draft, uh, as we all expected, Alexis Lafreniere went first overall. Quinn Byfield was projected number two for quite some time, ended up going there. And we all learned how to pronounce Tim's name. Maybe. Did, did we? <laughs> we? I know we learned that we've been pronouncing it wrong. I guess I guess what the way I should have said it was we all saw how to pronounce it. Yes. Do you want to take your best shot at it? Tim Stutzley. Yeah, I think that yeah, I think you nailed it. Tim Stutzley. Uh he went to the the Senators at number three. I mean, there's no better teacher than Alex Trebek to teach you how to learn things. It's true. Which a highlight of the draft, which says something about the draft. Yeah, because it happened within the first, what, 15, 20 minutes? That's generous. That happened about an hour and a half into the broadcast, I think. My God, what a what a brutal night that was. for As an audience member, I think I watched up to pick, I don't know, 14 or 15, and then I had to go to bed because it was like midnight. Yeah. I watched, I was like, I'm going to watch until Colorado's pick, which I mean, fortunately, because they had a good season, wasn't until number 25. It was a long night. Yeah. And like, I, I really feel bad for the television broadcasters for having to fill that void of space between the picks. But I can't remember, in a normal draft, do they get five minutes between picks? Yeah. yeah. It's just more exciting because you're at the arena, there's stuff happening. Like, you can like, see GMs talking to each other. And you have the players coming up, right? Like they announce the pick, then the next team gets on the clock and they spend the first minute and a half of that watching a guy walk up to stage, which you don't think is that interesting 
until you try to watch them on a Zoom call, <laughs> trying to like time delayed celebrate, which is equally awkward. Did you see the one guy who who the Oilers picked? He found out on Twitter before he saw it on his feed. Yeah. <laughs> Which is good. He probably because he found out because uh, Corey Promen was dropping every pick on Twitter before yeah. it actually happened. Honestly, after the Red Wings picked, I was like, I can turn this off now and just check my Twitter every five minutes. Yeah, absolutely. That's something you could have done. <laughs> so how are you? I guess the first three picks weren't super surprising. Number four was where we really got uh, into the world of the unexpected. How happy were you with what the Red Wings did? I was very happy with Lucas Raymond. There were kind of three players who I really wanted them to take. And then there was a second tier of a couple players who I would have been okay with them taking. But Lucas Raymond was absolutely in that first tier who I really wanted them to, to take. I would have been a little disappointed if they took a defenseman. Well, then that's, yeah, that's kind of where I think with number, as we get into number five, right? The Senators took Jake Sanderson, which like from what I can tell is the be- was the best defenseman in this draft. Um, but it just seems like their intent was fully, we're going to take a forward at three and a defenseman at five yeah, to split it up. And when you have those picks there, you can get away with that, but it's still not the best use of your resources. Yeah, I agree. And especially like specifically for Detroit, who's been drafting so defense heavy the last couple of years, they really need an elite goal scorer uh, in their top six. And that's what Lucas Raymond projects to be. Yeah, he's going to be a top player. I, I'm going to assume, because I actually I don't know, I'm going to assume the other two players that you wanted or would have been happy with were Marco Rossi and Cole Perfetti. Am I right? That is correct. And somehow they dropped to nine and 10. I don't know how this happened. And generally in drafts like this that are so deep, you can look at every pick in the top 10 and say, okay, you know, you may, you could have picked a forward. You could have picked a defenseman, whoever you pick though, you got a good player who's going to play in the NHL, but these guys were projected to go like top five. Yeah. And I would have been okay with one of them going at four. So to see them fall, like that is great, great value for Minnesota and Winnipeg. And as they were falling, I, this is one of the reasons I kept watching the television because I was like, come on, Stevie, trade up. You can, you can do this. These guys are falling. You can trade up and grab them. But yeah, well, and, like there's a shocking amount of like, you look at it even in hindsight now, like Buffalo took the wrong Ottawa 67. At yeah. number eight. Like they didn't even take the best player on that team in the draft. Th- that's the one pick that I'm kind of like, why? That was the only one that I was like, I don't, I don't get this one. Yeah. Kind of went mean, off the board there. Again, Drysdale to the ducks. If they wanted a defenseman, sure. I don't, don't agree with it. I still think they should have gone one of those two, but fine. Holtz at three or at seven to New Jersey. He's that, he's a good pick. I would have probably taken him, you know what, se- probably seventh. But Perfetti and Rossi should have gone ahead of him. Yeah. But then uh, my and my favorite thing about Quinn is that it's literally the Hughes brothers just mashed up their names. I'm not sure that it's not a different Jack and Quinn Hughes just combining to become like standing on each other's sol- shoulders, being Jack Quinn. <laughs> Wearing a trench coat. <laughs> exactly. They're playing a game uh, of giant doctor. I I actually thought that this was their younger brother for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. The the third Hughes. I thought it was the third Hughes until they were it was that five minute gap and they were talking about it and something just clicked. I was like, wait, his name's not Hughes. Why do I think he's one of them? I love the fact that in your head, you thought a reasonable thing. And I, you know what? I feel bad if you happen to get a third kid that you're like, we're so out of ideas. We're just going to make your first name one of your brother's names. And we're going to make your last name the other brother's name. That's just what we'll do. It's just a funny thing my brain did. I can't be alone in that. <laughs> no, no. Especially, you know, with the draft being so 
Hughes heavy the last few years. I like that. That's good. Uh, maybe maybe Kevin Adams got confused. <laughs> he probably did. Like the infamous <laughs> Jeff Finger signing with the Leafs. <laughs> He's just like, I, I'm a businessman. I was overwhelmed with all these player names. Yeah, there's so many numbers out there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> uh, Yaroslav Askarov goes number 11 to Nashville, which really helped. I mean he's not going to be NHL ready for a couple of years and helps them transition away from uh, Pekka Rene, potentially um, UC Saros kind of can bridge that gap as well. Yeah. I, th- I love this pick for Nashville, but you look at the list of these teams, realistically picking a goalie like that, he, these goalies are young and they're going to be a while anyways. So, any one of these teams could have picked them and I would have been like, okay, that's a good pick for them. Yeah. Yeah. After that, uh, I'd say the biggest one that we saw, Calgary kept trading down, which at, in a draft like this, when there isn't someone that they wanted particularly, I liked. I would have uh, – they did trade away. I Washington took Hendricks Lapierre at 22. Big injury question marks there. Um, but also plays for Shakutami, Nick. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> Does he? Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. <laughs> a, a real place. Um, but he was one that had concussion problems and question marks if he would be healthy. But if he is healthy, a steal of a pick there for Washington. And then your Colorado Avalanche. Yeah, Justin Barron taking a defenseman at 25. I'm not... I mean, I, I'm not sold on the pick. I'm not also sure, though, who else they could have taken. But I'm also all in on Joe Sackick, so I'm just going to implicitly trust everything that he does at this point. Yeah, see, you and I feel the same about our GMs. <laughs> who, who knew when we were you know, back in the 90s, who knew that those captains would have just become the best general managers too? I don't know, but it makes me so happy. <laughs> it makes me so happy. Uh, and then lastly, kudos to the San Jose Sharks for drafting a guy named Ozzy. Just yes. a solid name. Yeah, very good. Uh, anything else stand out to you from the draft? Uh, not really. Uh, I thought the format was terrible. Um, I wouldn't put myself through that again. It was very, very long. Uh, I didn't watch any of day two. But I guess day two went on all day. So, I don't know. It was, a, it was a rough one this year. Yeah, it's more boring doing it this way. Because, like, I mean, even still, when they get to interview the players, it's even later. Like, you're introducing the 20th pick, and you're like, let's interview the number 10th overall selection. Yeah. Whereas before, you'd like, they'd walk off the stage, and you could do it right away. Yeah. It was kind of cool seeing all these guys, all these prospects celebrate with their families and their homes. It was kind of cool seeing their homes. <laughs> that was an that was an interesting piece. The one guy had a chandelier hanging like two feet from the floor. Um, I'd I'd rather watch it in an arena though. Yeah, and I'd rather watch it. One thing that I they kept talking about and trying to figure out was if the lack of in person hurt the trading. And it absolutely did. Like when you yeah. can't just walk over and talk to someone and you're having to make phone calls consistently and you can't see what's happening, you can't see who's talking, it really cut down on movement for other pieces at this draft. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I was expecting more, uh, especially kind of within the top four to 15 because it was such a deep draft and I thought teams would be going after their guys, but Lo and behold, everyone just kind of took what fell to them. Yeah. And and you also have a hard, harder time knowing if someone is going to be able to fall. Because like, you can't just walk over and be like, hey, do you want this guy? Yeah. You kind of yeah. just like, you, you take your, your guy. And at least just some situations, I, the Devils had three picks. And I'm not sure, other than Holtz, like the other two were not great. Columbus's pick was terrible. And... So some of those other pieces, like you're, you're reaching for guys more than you normally would. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Did you see the Rangers release video though of um, uh, their GM finishing the trade with Calgary? No. 
on the phone. It was kind of neat. I, I'm I'm fascinated by those behind the scenes conversations, but they just took a video of him on the phone uh, with the Calgary GM and he's going, okay, we'll give you this and this for this. And, and they closed the deal right there on the phone. Just like that. Well, interesting. Very um, cool. Yeah, that is cool. Some, some trades happened kind of before the draft that uh, included some picks. We got Matt Murray headed to Ottawa. We, we kind of expected him to be on the move. A little surprising that's where he ended up. It is a little surprising, but I thought it was a good move by the Senators to bring him in. Second round pick was the the price tag, which is a fine price tag. Yeah. Um, but then I look at what I think they should have waited a couple days to sign him to a contract because they ended up, they gave him an extension, $6.25 million for Matt Murray. Which ended up being the second highest cap hit for a goaltender that was handed out this week. For for what, four years? Four years, 6.25. So $25 million over two years. I just don't understand this team. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm wrong. It is the highest cap hit. It beat Jacob Markstrom's. It is the most money per year handed out to a goaltender this offseason. He must have a good agent. Well, like the senators have cap space, but don't use it foolishly. Like what? There was. I don't. I don't get that at all. Showing confidence in your goalie, but I don't know. I don't get it either, Carl. I thought it was a great acquisition, and then you look at the signing, and you're like, really? Him? Yeah. That much? <laughs> like you if guys? it had been. If it had been in a you know Cam Talbot cap it, Cam Talbot got three point six for three years. Is he is he better than Cam Talbot? Yeah, I would think so. I would hope so. Is he twice as good as Cam Talbot? No. No. Absolutely not. I think if you were especially giving him that extra year. I think if it had been, it should have been more in the five million dollar range. Like it was off by a fair chunk, even four, four and a half. I would. So do you? Like, okay. So do you? So this, but this must say that the Senators feel like in the next four years they'll be competitive. Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, because you've got to have like, this year their draft picks from this season are not in, but for next year you're going to have Stutzley. You're going to have um, Sanderson probably on the team as well. You've got those other picks that they've kind of been adding up and prospects. Mm-hmm. Which also means that they're going to be a young team full of entry-level deals. So they can kind of get by, but you're wasting it. Like you can use that money on something else. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Especially with the way the goalie contracts landed this year. They should not have ended up paying him this much. Because I, actually, I thought the goalie market ended up being pretty mild compared to what I was expecting. Uh, yeah, I mean, the amount of deals that happened were, were large, and we'll get into those right away here. Um, lots, of, lots of goalies on the move, as expected. A number of them actually signed pretty quickly. I did not expect them to sign as quickly as they did in a free agency. It's kind of like a game of musical chairs. Well, I did see, I saw a graphic that like literally just shifted the teams from one, one to the other. There was a way for like five of them. They were able to just make it happen. So let's, let's start with the first piece. Henrik Lundqvist was rumored to go to the Washington Capitals and he did stay in the Metro division, um, going there on a one year, one and a half million dollar deal. This is going to be weird, man. It's going to be weird seeing Lundqvist in a, in a different jersey. Look, I think the cap hit is fine for Lundqvist. I think he's still a serviceable def, uh, defenseman goalie. But I, like, I have bigger question marks about this team. Like we talked earlier when they got knocked out of the playoffs. Are they, are they still in it every year? Are they still competitive and Stanley Cup worthy? every year now or have they gone over that hump 
I think they're, I mean, they're playoff worthy. They're really hoping and putting their, their hopes and dreams in that Ilya Samsonov is going to be the guy, right? Like, yeah, they're, they're, and we don't know yet, right? There's no way for us to know if he is or is not good. Yeah, I agree. And there's not a better guy than Lundqvist to go there and help him get to be great. I just, I look at it from Lundqvist's perspective and I look at this team and how they've, they performed this last year. And I'm like, I don't, is this my best chance at winning a Stanley cup? Right. To, to be a, in a goalie split situation, is this your best chance? And I don't think so. So it was a, it, it was a little surprising to me from, from that, from Lundqvist's perspective, but from Washington's, side this is a great deal yeah that's as as cheap as you could rightfully get even a backup goalie yeah what the center i I don't recall the exact dollar amount let me pull it up here like brian elliott got the exact same money to stay in philadelphia i'd much rather have in a split brian elliott or henrik lunk was over elliott so yeah yeah um Totally agree. Great deal for them. Washington also brought they brought in Justin Schultz too on a like two year four million dollar deal. They've got the cap space for that. It's fine. Um, next year they've got a you know a, a bit more room depending on uh, some of these guys to sign. I mean Ov's deals up next year, so that kind of clears out a bunch of cap space. But they'll need to get him back. Um, so kind of like this is their team, right? This is their team for now yeah. two more years. There's no tinkering. I mean, they could tinker at the draft, but like, or in trades, but um, this is it. This is their team. And I think that they can still get it done. Yeah, well, uh, we'll see. It's, they're definitely in the conversation, but I have less confidence in them than, than some of the other teams in that conversation. Well, the rest of, like, the Rangers have gotten better. Yeah. So they're going to be competitive to them. I'm not sure. I mean, I think the Penguins have taken a similar step back, kind of on par with the Capitals. Uh, the Flyers probably stayed are staying the same. They might, you know, another year Carter Hart, another year better. You can probably see them taking another bit of a, a step. The Devils got better, but we said that last offseason too, and look where we are. <laughs> Yeah. What about so, the Jackets? You think they got better? Because they made some moves. No. I'm going to go with no. <laughs> Did they get worse? I mean, so I'm trying to remember, recall all the Jackets moves. They made, there was the Max Domi trade. Yeah, that's the primary one that comes to my mind. Yeah, so they, they, acquired Max Domi, traded away Josh Anderson, and then went ahead and gave Domi a $5.3 million contract. So it's a lot of money. Yeah, but he's a, he's a good player. It's, it's for two years. I don't think that that's a crazy deal. It's less money than they're giving Gustav, Gustav Nyquist right now. Okay. You said two years for Domi on that? Two years. Two years at 5.3 per. Okay. The the length I'm more okay with. Also, now that I look at this roster, like no one on this team has a contract beyond two years from now. So yeah. it's nice that they uh, – is that when Kirk Alinen's contract expires? And he's <laughs> like, I'm just going to walk away, and you guys, you, you fix this problem. I'm fine with it. They don't have any – like any big ticket contracts on this team. So I'm okay with doing that, with taking advantage of a cheap Seth Jones and Zach Wierenski deal um, to the point that I, like, I think they should take some runs at someone else. Like, I don't think they should be done. Yeah. I'm surprised they weren't more in on Taylor Hall. I mean, Taylor Hall is an interesting case study in and of itself. Yeah. I, I'm, I agree. I'm glad that we've got our Sabres insider on the show today to give us a little <laughs> bit of a glimpse 
into what happened there with that. So I don't know. I think the Jackets they're they're not at greatness yet. They're a deep team and they're a tough team. Like we've seen what they could what they could do on kind of motivation and grit. I think that they need to go out and get some some skill up front. Someone to help Pierre Luc Dubois because he can't he can't carry this team. No. No. Um yeah, I'm I think that they'll probably be another fringe as they were this year. They were a fringe playoff team, and I don't think yeah. trading for Max Domi makes them that much better. Maybe yeah. this year just because Anderson was hurt, but I don't really get that trade for either Montreal or like it kind of just seems like you're just like shuffling deck chairs at this point. That was exact when I first heard it, my exact reaction was like, okay, so nothing changed. Yeah. Just a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's keep let's keep with the goalie. So Lungfist to Washington, which means Braden Holtby went to Vancouver. He signed there on a two year deal. Uh, which I've now closed. Do you have the, the dollar numbers on that one? I do. Two years at $4.3 million per. $4.3 million for Hopi. That seems like a, a reasonable... I mean, the term is short, which is what will kind of be a determining factor on most of these deals. Um, less than what they would have had to pay to keep Jacob Markstrom in town. So um, I think that's a great deal for the Canucks. This is a great deal. Hey, man, all year when we were talking about the Capitals and talking about Braden Holpe, we were like, they're going to have to re-sign him at like $8 million, aren't they? Yeah. And, well, so, and, then he, and then he put up a dud of a year, so. Yeah. So that, that could also with the flat cap, also with what the other starting goalies were going for, you know, for a goalie like Braden Holpe, I think this is a, this is a good deal for them. Yeah. And it, I mean, he's, he hasn't been top Braden Holpe for, for at least the last two years, but is still a starting goalie in this league is still. And when, when you can pay to have that and to be able to have trust, and he's also healthy, right? Like he's not one who's struggled with injury problems. So you know that like he's going to play. Yeah, definitely. And then, like you said, he's a serviceable starter. And then for those weeks where he's not, you've got Thatcher Demko and we'll see kind of what that split looks like at the start of this year and how it changes over the course of the season. Yeah. And, and they really are hoping uh, in this two year deal that by the end of it, that Demko is the starter. Yeah. Right. And, and if, and if Demko takes over next year, which I think would probably be the hope, right? Demko takes over next year, then Holpe becomes the one B or two. And you're fine with that. Now, when is the expansion draft? Is it next off season? Yes. Because this is a player that I could see them exposing. He doesn't have a no move clause. He just has a modified no trade. So he could be exposed in the expansion draft. Seattle's not far from Vancouver. That's not a huge move for him. It wouldn't surprise me to see Braden Holby as the starting goalie of the Seattle Kraken. Yeah, I can I can get behind that. Um, well, then I think a lot of these deals, right? A lot of these two year deals are look are looked at from that lens of like this is someone we can expose in the draft. This is someone we yeah. don't have to protect. Yeah, yeah. I thought this whole free agency period was very team friendly. Oh, absolutely. Well, it had to be right with the flat cap teams suddenly have way less money. Yeah, because the the one deal that I look at, and again had a down year so his value dropped but i look at that tyson berry deal in edmonton yeah and there's no way that that would have been in a normal season in a normal off season and if he had have played at the level of before we were looking at like seven eight million dollar contract and not even close dude was really unhappy in toronto eh? <laughs> <laughs> right i mean when Connor mcdavid calls you and says hey we want you you kind of just show up, don't you? I, I would. Yeah. I mean, he could have just like gotten on the phone and called up Nathan McKinnon, but kind of burnt that bridge already. So <laughs> yeah, I think so too. <laughs> I was really surprised. I mean, well, 
we let's just talk about Tyson Berry since we're here. I was very surprised when I saw the rumors that it was like he could end up in Vancouver, Edmonton, or Colorado. R- really, that's that's the third option there. Tyson Berry back there after all of what uh, what has gone on with that organization and him just bringing him back. So you knew, you knew right away. It's like okay, well, a third of those teams is not happening, <laughs> right. which narrows down my options of being right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he got what four year or sorry one year one year, yeah one year four million dollars um to go to Edmonton, not even three seven five, which again is a very team friendly deal. But Ken Holland is this guy continues to hurt my head. <laughs> you know, like like that's a that's a great deal to to go out and get, but you hurt. I don't know if you saw some of some of the play, other players he was in on and some of the dollar amounts that he was offering them. Why? Apparently but, you need quite the discount to go to Edmonton or quite, quite the incentive rather. <laughs> Kyle Turris didn't seem like he needed that much incentive. That's true. That was, that was a great signing. Yeah. Right. Him back. I know that people were not happy. People in Edmonton were not happy with Mike Smith being back and for good reason. Um, especially when, again, he got the same money as Henrik Lundqvist. If you're looking for more reason why Henrik Lundqvist deal, same term, same dollar amount, but one is Mike Smith. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Edmonton got to a point where they were running out of options because they were in on Markstrom and he went to Calgary. Uh, this, to me, just feels like, okay, what's left? Who can we scoop up pretty quickly here? And let's move on. I'm still not confident in their goaltending. No. Big no, question mark for me. Because it's the exact same as last year. Now, granted, yeah. this, this team is better, right? They brought in Turris. Yes, he pulled Yarvi. They managed to drag him back from Europe. So that'll be interesting. It'll be, it will be really interesting to see how he does over here. So they, they signed him to a two-year deal. Super small money again. Um, and then... And then a one-year deal for Tyson Berry. So very little money spent from them, right? They brought in those three players. Mike Smith stayed, but they brought in those three players for a cap hit of less than $6 million. Yeah, it's very good. And, you know, we'll see how their season goes, but they're in a very favorable position at the trade deadline this year. Yeah, for sure. You know, they've got Barry. Adam Larson and Chris Russell all coming up at the end of this year. And all three of those, I could see even Chris Russell, I could see teams going after at the trade deadline. Or the Oilers are in a playoff spot. Or they're in a playoff spot. And and they're able to take on someone with having that deal. I think this year at the trade deadline, knowing again, a flat cap, knowing that uh, you are going to have that expansion draft. I think we'll see some teams... The Oilers can take on money for next year, right? Because they have all that coming off. Um, They can take on some deals that, you know, someone's not really, they're not happy with the the contract. They can bring them in. So, I mean, they should be in a playoff spot. Absolutely, they should be. Uh, Yes, they should be. When you have, when you have, (laughs) they should be. Yeah, you have a a team with McDavid and Dry Seidel you should probably be in a playoff spot. It's not a question. They should be in a playoff spot. Yeah. Um, All right. So Jacob Markstrom no longer has a spot in Vancouver. He heads to Calgary on a six-year, $6 million per contract. That was the big one of the day, wasn't it? That was was Friday. That was the most money handed out on in free agency so far it wasn't the most per but if you, yeah, if you yeah. add up all total. years this is the total total dollar value this was the highest that's so, not true tory crew got more but for goalies for sure tory crew got a little bit more so i want to throw this one back to you carl and i want i want your thoughts on this as it's your local market and i think you have, probably have a little more depth knowledge on the team than i do is this good for calgary I mean, bringing 
him in is good for Calgary. Yes. Uh, they needed something. They already have lost TJ Brody this off season, right? He's gone. Yeah. Um, and they had, you know, very good depth at defense. So losing him's not a huge deal, but last year with Riddick and Talbot, we saw come the playoffs that they, they weren't enough and they weren't good enough in the regular season, right? They kind of just like continually flip flopped between uh, which one, instead of riding the hot hand, they just rode the less cold hand last season. And now they can solidify that and just have, this is the guy that we're going to use and ride. Um, so yes, that's a good deal for them to have that. I think it, it relieves a lot of stress off of their management. It relieves a lot of stress off of their coaching staff and it relieves a lot of stress off of their players to always be wondering about that. It's, I think it's really nice to just have a clear answer. He's the guy. Now let's focus our attention on other parts of the team. Right. Cause it's been years since Calgary's had that, right? Like I don't like, I want to say since the last time Calgary had that, like, was it all the way back to Kiprasov was the last time that Calgary had a number one? Probably. Like without, without, you know, cause when Mike Smith was here, he wasn't the guy. Right. No. And I'm, I'm trying to remember who was in net before him there. Um, so just to be able to have that and to have that sort of confidence in a goalie, um, is nice. Yeah, I totally agree. And like I said, now they got to turn their attention to the rest of the team. Cause I think that there's some more tweaks that need to be made. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me, I did just pull up, uh, yeah, no, they, they have not since, since Kiprasov left. It has been a miserable... Here's the list of goaltenders who have played... Who have split time. Every season's been a split. Kerry Ramo, Red Obera, Jonas Hiller, uh, Brian Elliott, Chad Johnson, Mike Smith, David Riddick, and Cam Talbot. Those are the goaltenders the Flames have had since Skipper Soft retired. Holy moly. Not good. No, but it's nice for them now to put put that behind them exactly it's not something that you're you're always having to figure out and and try to wait so um would i've liked it to be a shorter deal six million a year is fine but not for six years 36 year old jacob markstrom getting paid six million dollars is going to be bought out yeah but if you're going to the playoffs for six years is it worth it yeah absolutely if you're going to the playoffs for four years, is it worth it? Probably. I mean, yes. Like money, money wise, if that, if if he is the difference of making the playoffs or not, I, making the playoffs for one season in a regular playoff. I'm not sure how much the teams actually made for making the playoffs this year. Yeah, on, I don't. I don't think anybody made any money this year. <laughs> but it, on like ticket revenue, I believe they make a million dollars a game in in playoffs. So you make it twice and that's paid for a $6 million a year goaltender. Right. Um, so Cam Talbot then left there and he went to Minnesota, which. That's right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But like, I don't know. Minnesota has so many question marks around that team. I don't even know if it's fair to zone in on the goalie. <laughs> I mean, last time they picked up a former Edmonton Oilers goaltender, they they did pretty well with them. Who was it? Devin Dubnik. Was it Dubnik? Yeah. I don't remember him being an Oiler, but I believe you, Carl. Oh, I believe yeah, you wouldn't yes. leave me astray. <laughs> <laughs> that would yes. Devin Dubnik was was originally an Oiler. That's where he started. Uh I think I'd rather have Devin Dubnik than Cam Talbot. I would not. No? I would, I would rather Talbot, yeah. Well, then they got an upgrade. I mean, they had to retain half of Talbot or <laughs> Dubnik's money. So, like, they're paying both of them. But, yeah, I would rather. <laughs> I guess that's true. <laughs> especially on the dollar amount, I would rather have had uh, Talbot on that. But I don't think it's... A, a huge difference. 
Yeah, I mean, is Talbot really going to... How much further is Talbot going to take them than, than Dubnik? Yeah, like you said, the goaltender is not the issue with that team. There's, no. there's more. Um, all right, let's go to non-goaltenders that signed. Nick, Taylor Hall, one year, $8 million to go to your Buffalo Sabres. What First of all, there? who saw that coming? <laughs> when Taylor Hall said, yeah, I want to maybe in a playoff. It's like Matt Duchesne. When Matt Duchesne says, uh, you know what, I really want to be in the, play in the playoffs, and then he gets sent to the Ottawa Senators, and you're like, well, that didn't work for you. <laughs> What a weird, what a weird situation to happen. I just, I, I mean, I guess it makes sense that Taylor Hall doesn't want to sign his big UFA contract right now. Yes. Not the year so, to do that. So I get that. Now, is he, is he trying to go to a team where he can, make the playoffs so here here's a list of teams that currently have more than eight million dollars in cap space oh good this will be fun and we'll, we'll start at the bottom with the teams with the most cap space ottawa senators okay new york rangers okay that would have been a good one to go to. That would have been a that would have been a good one to go to. I agree. Yeah. You can have Hall on one side, Panarin on the other. Lafreniere well, down up. the middle. Yeah, right. Pretty okay. Your Detroit Red Wings. That would have been a great place to go to. I mean, maybe <laughs> not for. I mean, it's it's kind of on par with Buffalo, though. Yeah, um, I agree. New Jersey, they've been busy. Could have stayed and gone back to New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, he's like, been there, done that. Nashville. Seemed like a very Nashville move, to be honest. Like, that yeah, seemed like a move that Nashville would have made. Um, then we got Buffalo. We got Columbus. You talked about their need for some scoring to, to help Pierre. Yeah, and but Dubois. Taylor Hall and John Tortorella seems like a match made in hell. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fair. <laughs> All right. We, now we're getting into some more. Uh, we're, we'll, let's skip over the Kings and the Panthers. Uh, Boston Bruins. Yeah. That would have been a good one. Colorado Avalanche. Nah. That would... <laughs> Stop. Stop, Nick. <laughs> with, with, with all the moves that the Avalanche made in this offseason, I mean, they picked up Brandon Saad. We'll, we'll touch on that shortly. Um, and kind of just they kept everyone else around. Why not? Why not add a, a Taylor Hall to the mix? Are, are there any other teams on that list? Uh, we also then have the New York Islanders. Nah, okay. and, and the Philadelphia Flyers. Okay. So there's at least two teams on that list that are Stanley Cup contenders. Yes. That he goes, he goes to that city and he makes them even more of a Stanley Cup contender. Yes. And then there's a handful of teams on that list who are playoff teams without him right now. Yes. And he goes to that team and he could maybe make them more of a playoff team, help them go deeper in the playoffs. Yeah. The rest of the teams <laughs> all we're all last place teams. Like they're all <laughs> at the bottom of the league. And he decided to sign with one of those. Did anybody ask it? Like, was there some media availability yesterday? Did anybody ask him if he was okay? <laughs> blink, t- blink twice. If, <laughs> if you're being held against your will, like did the plane just stop in Buffalo? And he was like, well, I guess I'm here now. S- since we're here, he hates flying so much. He's like, I can't go through that again. Like, what's the most central team for all these? I want as little travel as possible. What is he? Now, okay, and he's got clauses on this contract. A no trade clause and a no move clause. So it's up to him. But because, so this is the other thing I think. Like, okay, so let's say Buffalo's in the basement again. You flip him at the deadline, collect a couple assets. He goes, he wins because he goes to a, a contender. You win, you get a couple draft picks or prospects. 
but they've given him all the power to control that. Yes, absolutely. I just, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, it's great for Buffalo. He'll help them for sure. He helps them, but like a one-year deal, are they, are they thinking that they're contending this year or are they thinking they're flipping them at the deadline? I, that's what I can't figure out. Because if they're not contending this year, all Taylor Hall does is get them a worse draft pick next year. If they, if, if they don't flip him. Like you either flip him and you get some sort of assets in back or you keep him and he ends up not really helping you. Like, like would have happened with the Coyotes this year, right? If not, for, if not for a pandemic shutting down the season, the Coyotes would not have made the playoffs likely and they would have traded a bunch of stuff for Taylor Hall and gotten nothing out of him. Yep. And you look at this Buffalo lineup, and even with Taylor Hall there, I'm still like, I don't know how they think that they're contenders. Right. Like, I mean, you've got the, the front line of, and I don't think they're going to put them all together, but you've got Skinner, Eichel, Hall. That's a solid place to start. Yeah, I mean, they're going to need Jeff Skinner to, to bounce back a little bit. Yes. But then you look like defensively, they got Dalene. They've got Darlene in net. Like Carter Hutton doesn't excite me in any way. No. So maybe maybe they're going to trade Taylor Hall for a goalie at the deadline. Maybe that's why didn't they? Plan. Why didn't they take Askarov? That would have been a great pick for them. They were busy taking the third Hughes brother. Look, anytime you can combine the abilities of Jack Hughes and Quinn Hughes into one person, you have to do it, Nick. It's just a super Hughes. It's a, a Hughes idea. <laughs> yeah, they, sh- they should have taken Askarov. They sh- what, or the other, or Perfetti or Rossi, but they didn't. I don't get it, man. I, I, I did not see this one coming. No. When that dropped last night, I was shocked. Yeah. Um, all right, other signs. The aforementioned, I talked to Tori Krug. He got, got the most money now that I actually, you know, mathed it out. Uh, Tori Krug got the most money of anyone signing a seven year deal, six and a half million dollars per with the St. Louis Blues. As they say, farewell to Alex Petrangelo. Yeah, so that was a big surprise for me on this one. As soon as they signed Krug, it meant that. Petrangelo was gone. Yeah. Which seemed likely anyways, and this just really put the nail in that coffin. Yeah, for sure. Now, looking at the crew contract, it's long, uh, but I think the annual average value, I don't think it's that bad. No, uh, six and a half for that's fine. I Tory Crew's a good defenseman, uh, worth that money. Lengthwise... I mean, a good a good top level defender or any position requires something like that, um, and I think he he's gonna continue to play well for a while. So I'm not uh, I'm not too upset with that one for the Blues. Yeah, no, I think it's a good deal. Uh, but how about the story that the Bruins made him an offer and then pulled the offer? The, the Bruins have not had a banner free agency. <laughs> kind of a that's kind of an interesting uh tactic to to deal with your ufas yeah yeah the boston bruins i mean now on defense they've now lost zidane ochara and tori krug um they haven't lost anyone of note up front jake debrus still needs to sign there's talks that he might be traded elsewhere as well um and have not signed anyone so this Bruins team needs to do something for next year. Yeah. Now they did say, uh, Tuka Rask, I don't, I didn't know that this was a possibility, but after him leaving the bubble, apparently for some, there was a question mark of, if he would be coming back to this team, like if he would just not return. Um, but he is, that's the thing that someone felt the need to ask him and talk to him about was if he would return to this team. 
But when he left the bubble, literally everybody was like, no, no, it's a family situation. We agree with him leaving. He's got to do what he's got to do. There's no hard feelings. Apparently they lied. <laughs> Turn, turns out some hard feelings. Well, he'll be back. Yeah. Now we know. Uh, but most <laughs> of the d- decor in front of him will not. <laughs> right. Hey, they, they still got Charlie McAvoy, Brandon Carlo. But it's worse, for sure. Yeah. I, yeah. Anyways, the Tory Krug deal is a good one, I think. Yeah. For both parties. Yeah. Uh, I was surprised how much money Kevin Shattenkirk got to go after being bought out by the Rangers just like a year ago. And now Anaheim's given him almost $4 million a year. It's like they didn't learn their lesson. It's crazy, right? That's what a Stanley Cup does. Right? I mean, it got Zach Bogosian a deal in Toronto. Bogosian, Shattenkirk. You know, these were guys that were bought out. Like, Zach Bogosian was waived, was he not? And he cleared waivers? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And now, I mean, he didn't get a lot of money. It was what, one million, one and a half million? Just over a million, yeah. 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 So that's fine. But like, Shattenkirk deal? Ridiculous. They're going to regret that one. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a bad idea. Uh, TJ Brody, I like that deal for Brody in Toronto. Uh, yeah, I like that deal too. Four years, five million each, uh, and that replaces uh, the Tyson Berry size toll. Which I mean, I think Brody's going to fit in better on that team than what we saw from Tyson Berry at less money. They need, I think, they need Brody's style more than Berry's. They don't need a quarterback on the power play. No. They have that already. They have several of those that they can yeah. move around. What they need is someone who can play solid hockey in their own end, get the puck out, and uh, be consistent. And that's what yes. TJ Brody is. Yeah, and play a good, smart, defensive game. Because that, to me, is always where they, this team breaks down. Exactly. And I think Brody really helps with that. And then the other thing the Leafs did that I thought was funny is they went out and added a bunch of grit, too. <laughs> Wayne Simmons. Uh, who else they had? Zach Bogosian. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, Zach Bogosian. We talked about him. Jason uh, Spezza, the fighter. The fighting Spezzas. I mean, the, this is what they are going to be needing to do, right? Is signing either bring up young rookies, right? On yeah. cheap deals or sign veterans to league minimum contracts. And they've got what? Bogosian, Simmons, BC, three players that are coming in total less than three million. And Spezza, four, right? They're looking at four players for four million bucks. Yep. That's what you got to do. That's it. And you got to hope that they can all contribute in one way or another. I mean, they're right up against the cap. I, I, I assume this is it. Like, this is their team going into next season. Yeah, there's not really much room for them. I mean, they traded Andreas Janssen out to clear a little bit more cap space as well. But yeah, there's not really... I mean, they, they, there's no way they can sign someone to fit them back in. And it just no. seems like they'll be... Uh, I don't foresee any other trades either. So no. this is it. It'll be interesting. Another year of Leafs hockey next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's, a couple trades we haven't talked about yet. Um, Paul Statsny off to the Winnipeg Jets as they try as the Knights try to clear out space, presumably to sign Alex Petrangelo. Statsny back to the Jets. Back again. Yeah. And what did they give up for him? Like a, a conditional fourth? Was it that low? Oh, yeah, it was that low. Yeah. And salary retained, I believe, as well. And salary retained. Yeah, it's no salary. I don't know. Uh, no, no salary retained on that. I didn't think so. Um, I don't know. I think it's a it's a fine trade. It doesn't to me. It doesn't really address what Winnipeg needs. But I mean, it does. So it it doesn't right. Like Paul Stastny's not a defender. It does give them a second line center, which they also didn't have that. Yeah, and we we saw that glaringly obviously when Shifley went down in the playoffs, and you're like, all right, what do we like? Cody yeah, Eakin destroyed is, them. It's coming yeah. in. So to have that second piece 
helps out big time. They did also, I mean, they somewhat addressed, they brought in Dylan DeMello, which is like, whatever. Yeah. But it's, it's better than some of the people they were tossing out there last year. Yeah, I agree. And like, it did, like the return's not that big. Like it didn't hurt them that much. So that, I, I, I don't have any issue with them going out and doing this. Yeah. Um, really those were the, the only moves that they made picking him up for nothing. One year left on that deal for Stastny. So that's fine. Yeah. Um, and then as well, Brandon saw it off to my Colorado avalanche. I saw that. That was a trade for Nikita Zadorov. Yeah. Uh, which like I have Nikita Zadorov is one of those players that comes in plays well as a young player and just like never really hits that potential. And you can see that potential and he would make, he's like, he's one of those players that is good when he's good and terrible when he's terrible. And there's very little middle ground for him. Like there's not like, Oh, you had like an okay game. It's you were really good there. You, you know, we're solid on the puck. You, you know, managed to shut guys down, but, and then you also took like an unnecessary elbow cause you're eight feet tall and don't know how to control this. <laughs> so it's like that, that's what you're going to get. And he was a guy that just never seemed to figure out how to do that. The skill is there and they just, he never seemed to be able to put that together. And, uh, I'm okay that he's gone. Brandon Saad coming in is going to be great. It kind of gives that nice secondary level of scoring. Uh, good on the PK, uh, which, I mean, better him on the PK than Zadorov. So um, I like that and uh, excited to have him on the team next year. Yeah, I think this is a great move by the Avalanche. I think Brandon Saad will do great on that team. Which also then led to do Jonathan Taves speaking on behalf of the rest of the Blackhawks and saying, Hey, we don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> that was interesting. eh? Yeah. That um, was, that was interesting. And to go to the media with it, it makes me wonder if they had that conversation with management, if that leadership group had had that conversation, like, Hey guys, are we going to be part of this part of this conversation or not? And then, like, during that meeting, they get out of the meeting and the sod trade happened. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely keep you in the loop on things. We'd love your input. Oh, by the way, we, we traded your friend. <laughs> yeah. Bowman's phone's just dinging throughout the whole meeting. Yeah, it's like, you, are you going to get that? You need to get that? No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. No, no. I got my auto reply on. Auto reply, except. <laughs> <laughs> and like G- Gary Batman's texting him like are you are you sure yeah, except yeah um yeah interesting there so and they're so they're not happy right Taves Kane Keith I'm not sure how many people Jonathan Taves spoke on behalf of it was interesting depending on which article you read they either referred to it as the big three or the core four. So some places are like, nah, Brent Seabrook, you're out, you're done. <laughs> um, but then never really said who just like kind of speaking for himself, not happy with the fact of these moves. Uh, turns out he didn't sign up for a rebuild. Who knew? I mean, how could you not know though? It's like, I don't know. It's a little, uh, I don't know. It's a little ignorant on his part. I think, Wait. yeah, like they, they've got some really good young pieces in, but like, come on, dude, how long did it take you core four to figure it all out before, before you guys went and, and won championships? When you did, how did you think it was going to go when yeah. you signed Brent Seabrick until he was 39 years old? How did you, well, did you think it would go? signing an eight-year, 10-per deal for you and Patrick Kane. How well did you think it would go signing Duncan Keith till he was 39 as well? Like, what did you think was going to happen to this team? And honestly, they're doing better than they should be. 
Like this, they were, this year, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And you look at some of these players that are coming up, the young guys, like they have some strong assets here. So I, I don't know. To me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doubting Stan Bowman. He's made some pretty good moves and brought in some pretty good players and kept the team competitive. They're not bottoming out. No. Now, granted, last year they managed to do what they did with Robin Lehner and that. There is no Robin Lehner this year. That is true. There's, there's not even a Corey Crawford this year. This year there is a Malcolm Subban, and maybe they'll pick up one of these other goalies that's sitting out there. But as it stands right now, there's not, uh, there's not as good of a team around them as there was. That's a, that's a really good point. That's a scary thought, their goalie situation. So, and I, the, the Crawford one, I think, was the straw that broke their back, not even the sod deal. That, like, yeah. the guy who's been there with them, he's gone now. I mean, we, we didn't talk about him. Off to New Jersey, good deal for New Jersey. Yeah, I, I agree. I understand Chicago wanting to part ways at this point. Yeah, sure. And New Jersey needed the help in net. I mean, New Jersey needs a lot of help, but. I think it's a good get for Jersey for sure. Yeah. All right. And that, and that wraps up our first week. We still got Alex Petrangelo is the big ticket left unsigned as of right now. Um, and yeah, Bob- but it sounds like he's been wined and dined quite well out on the West coast. Yeah. It sounds like he's going to be heading to, uh, heading to Vegas. Uh, Mike Hoffman still out there. Carl Soderberg. If anyone wants to add a Carl to their team. Uh, you can call him. You could call me too. I'm available. Um, so some of those pieces still gonna still gonna sign. Um, so we'll hopefully before next week's show. We'll see. It's still a pretty active market, it seems. Yeah, lots of teams. Lots of teams are really wanting to get this uh, extended off season underway. They're like, let's just let's just get our team on lockdown. Kyle Dubas is like, hey, look, I want some nice fall winter vacation i'm gonna go somewhere south even though the borders are closed he's gonna he's gonna find a way he'll fi- he'll find a way with those private mlse jets exactly yeah uh, side note uh we got our first snow of the year today here in calgary no you didn't i it was a beautiful fall day yesterday our fall has been amazing it was like 20 degrees in several days in this last week woke up to uh i looked outside i was like it's raining and that rain is big and white and sticking around. So uh, it's officially hockey season. That means, right, Nick, when it snows? <laughs> yeah, normally it would, but not in 2020, Carl. Well, it, that, but that here the weather's it's... the weather's been beautiful here. Nice 30 degree weather. I'm fine if it snows on Thanksgiving. That's like a a normal. It's kind of the turning point, right? Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Summer's done when Thanksgiving hits. So yeah. Um, thanks for tuning in this week. You can find us at the fourth line podcast.com at fourth line podcast on Twitter. Let us know. I mean, if there's a, a move that your team has yet to make and you want to let us know what you think it should be, or you want to vent, we've, we've had lots of people venting some, uh, previously to the hall signing. We had Sabres fans venting. Now we have Sabres fans gloating, uh, Ottawa senators fans are just still unhappy. Um, and probably will be for, several years um blackhawks fans aren't too happy right now so kind of we'll just some group therapy in the comments section we'll get some of that going and uh you can find us on itunes spotify google play uh full press radio full press app you can find us on all those places we'll be back next week with our 300th episode oh it's time for us to wrap up another fourth line show i know what you're thinking you don't want us to go Jack Quinn might not be a Hughes, and his name still isn't as good as Cliff Pooh.